and disconnection. Well, thank you, Manisha. I wish we'd had that on before. Anyway, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I am a therapist, author. I've written some other books. And also, I like to do some speaking. So I appreciate that Manisha hosts me most months to do a personal development session. So today, we're focusing on return to center uh, and some of the contents. And we'll do some of the exercises in it. So I got recently asked, what does return to center mean? And I thought, well, that's a really good place to start. What does that mean? It means that sometimes it's as if we lose ourselves. We get triggered and we often get triggered into the fight, flight, defend response or the give up, depressed, collapsed response. Uh, sometimes fawning comes in, but I'm not going to focus on fawning right here. So we want to come back to center. It is important for us sometimes to flee, to fight. It is sometimes important for us to give up. But we want to be able to return to center where we're calm, present, can connect with other people, connect with ourselves, even a sense of noticing ourselves and other people. In the place of center, we can feel and think at the same time. So let's take a look at some of the contents and some of the uh, tips that we can glean and information we can glean from the book, Return to Center. Well, it got inspired three years ago when I took a couple of courses based on the polyvagal theory. And I don't totally understand all the nuances of the research of Dr. Stephen Porges. However, I got really, really curious. And my curiosity led me to developing some systems that I found worked with my clients. So the polyvagal theory it emphasizes the role of the autonomic nervous system. That is the system in our body that we don't even think about that looks after digestion and breathing and um, all those automa automatic processes that are going on in our bodies without us typically noticing. And especially the, the vagus nerve, which is responsible for many, many aspects of us resting and digesting and good health. And it's like a bunch of little sneaky uh, streams that go from the back of our head all through our, our lungs, our heart, uh, even the throat and down stomach and the intestines. So it affects many of the major uh, organs of our body. And we can understand how safety, co-regulation, co and connection are paramount to a healthy human experience. And co-regulation means that we can come together like this. We can make connection with one another in a, a calm, heart-to-heart, -heart, present way. But if one of us gets triggered, we're not co-regulated. So I would like you to put in the chat box, if you are a person who is required to be present, that is to create emotionally safe spaces, are you required to stay at center for other people in the service of other people? I'd like to know how many uh, people are online that that's part of their responsibility. Would you just just put a yes or a check mark or something in the chat box so that we can see it? Let me just, I'm taking a peek here. Yes, and like at times. Of course, Rana. Welcome, Rana. I'm glad people stayed 
I was worried people were going to run home or turn the computer off when we were delayed. Yeah. Okay, so there's a number of people. Hello, Donna. Good to see you. All right. So in this presentation, you will have some ideas about what to pay attention in and of yourself and with other people. Becoming a noticer, becoming an observer is very, very important for, for keeping a space between what often that trigger and our response to it, whether it's uh, in our own behaviors or in relationship to other people. Wonderful. So thank you for that. I'll be asking you to do a couple more things as we move along. Okay, here's a quotation by the Dr. Stephen Porges, sort of to set the stage here for us. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. So there he is emphasizing your ability to return to center, to be able to be present to yourself and to other people. And the result is improved mental health for yourself and those people that you interface with. A quick, quick little review of the autonomic nervous system. And I don't, I don't again, understand all of the nuances that a medical professional would, but I know enough to help clients in uh, my counseling practice and or my workshops. And key player in the autonomic nervous system is the prefrontal cortex. And that has been developed over the decades and centuries for us to make connection, to create safety for ourselves. And that prefrontal cortex, when we don't feel safe, either physically or emotionally, uh, Dan Siegel calls it flipping the lid. And the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully function when we are feeling in danger. All of our systems get into sort of an alarm state triggered by the amygdala, which is like a fire alarm of our, our whole system. And when it gets fired, we are more interested in staying alive, in taking care of ourselves. And we're not really present to, uh, to other people. Imagine the fire alarm going off in your house, in your house. Now you may quickly look around for your loved ones and, and grab them. But if there's, if you're having a conversation with somebody, you're not gonna focus on their feelings or their thoughts. You're gonna focus on getting yourself safe. And the same response happens when somebody yells at us and we get triggered or somebody start, starts to do something that looks like they're going to physically harm us. We have that same alarm that goes on for us that disconnects us from the relationship. So, and then return to center is bringing the prefrontal cortex back intact so that we can make connection. And here's a picture of the vagus nerve that I referred to before. And you can see how it weaves all through the major parts of our body. And it affects so much of our functioning when we don't keep what's called what Stephen Poor just calls vagal tone. We want a healthy vagal tone. And I'll discuss a little bit later what that means. But you can see that the vagus nerve affects our mood. It affects our speech. Uh, it, is, it affects even saliva. I've had clients that could hardly speak and they said their mouth was very dry. It affects our breathing when we start to have that anxiety, panic breathing, or the very deep, big, depressed sighs. It affects our blood pressure our skin, our muscles, we can start to feel tingly. I sometimes have people that start to shiver in sessions, uh, affects your digestion. 
and your elimination system. So very key to the whole polyvagal theory. And I did talk about the amygdala. It is an almond-shaped brain mass which processes fearful, threatening, and dangerous stimuli. And it affects the vagus nerve. We want that vagus nerve to be in good shape so we can properly rest and properly digest our food and think clearly. Okay, and here's a little picture <laughs> of the brain. And when the amygdala is triggered and, and is giving the message that we're in danger, and by the way, there's another part of the brain that's called the hippocampus that's also involved in all of this activation of the nervous system. So typically as humans, we do the fight, the flee, you can put in defend, you can put in collapse, hopelessness, uh, giving up response uh, to the survival reaction of the activated amygdala. And I'm feeling very blessed that an illustrator in Calgary called Sam Hester provided me with illustrations for the book. An emotional regulation we've already talked about, but here's a definition for you. Controlling your attention, you're able to logically assess what's going on for you, and, and also emotional regulation helps you with strat emotional regulation involves a bunch of strategies for managing the nervous system stress responses. And I uh, hope you're not too bored with all these medical things before we get into the strategies, but it's we need a little bit of grounding. And this is what it's like when we can regulate ourselves, emotionally regulate, and that is to come back to center and to know that place well, to know what it feels like to be centered. And I talked a little bit about co-regulation, but it's really interesting that many people that have anger management issues, problems with depression, problems with anxiety, they often have a history of some attachment issues with their primary caregivers because our primary caregivers when we were babies actually are teaching us to come back to center. Just imagine the baby crying and fussing and not in a content, grounded, pleasant space. And if the caregiver doesn't attend to that child regularly, we can't do it every minute, but if there's not regular, consistent care, that child doesn't learn to bring itself back to center. So we have a lot of adults on planet Earth that don't know how to come back to center. So the more people that learn to do this, the better parents they will be, and then we'll have more of a healed, healed planet. So the process through which children develop through their caregivers, the ability to soothe and manage distressing emotions and sensations. And here I want to mention the whole field of addiction. Any process that's activity or substance that we ingest is an attempt to manage the emotions. Addiction is merely a process to try to self-soothe oneself, whether um, that is running, gambling, sex addiction, or the ingesting of substances, food, alcohol, and illegal drugs, right? Oh, it's important to know. But here we are with the, with the baby in that centered state saying, yes, I can come to calm when I'm with my caregiver, my present caregiver. And so for many adults, we are looking for a person, I usually recommend three, find three people who know how to come to center and welcome you to come to center. So here's a little exercise for you. I want you to pull out a piece of paper. If you've got a piece of paper handy, I hope you do. I'll just give you a minute here, find a piece of paper, and we're going to explore what might be the triggers for you of when you get off center, off center and get pulled out of being in center. And it's important for us, for our well-being, 
to have a list that we know if I'm entering this space or are going to have a conversation with this particular person, that I'm at risk of being triggered. So I put a list here on the screen. It's also in the workbook of different categories of triggers. I just had a client yesterday who he had previously made his list of triggers. And then he realized that when he spends time with his mother, she drinks too much and he gets very uptight and wants to flee. And it's a trigger for him because he grew up with, with people drinking too much. And so we added alcohol and he started, once we did that, once we named that trigger for him, he was able to name some other people who drink too much and then decided he was going to minimize his time with those people because life's too precious to go into a state of being triggered. So I want you to take a look and I'll give you a minute to write down specific people, animals, places, topics of discussion, some people, get triggered by politics. Okay, I hope you've got started at least a list of three uh, triggers that you're aware of. And the more you start that noticing process so that you can catch and name your triggers, the, the better. Um, just notice it. When am I feeling relaxed and calm and connected? And then what happened or said or turned up and then triggered me and pulled me out of center. Very interesting that some people put dogs on their list of triggers. And most often they've had a very distressing, perhaps harmful to them event with a dog. And then there's a number of people who put their precious dog on their list of creating emotional safety and calm. So I found that fascinating. We can have uh, different perspectives. Minim so the question is, with your list of triggers, how are you going to minimize and manage those triggers? I'll give you a couple of examples. So I have a, a trigger, even though I've had lots of therapy and I'm handling life much, much better. I don't have anger management issues anymore, which I did in my 30s, I still have an aversion to mice and rats. They pull me back to a memory that I'm not fond of in our old farmhouse and our barn that had problems with mice and rats. They just, I just feel myself curling in. So if we find um, a mouse in our garage or whatever, I leave it for my husband who attend to. Thanks for sharing, Alicia. Yes, sarcastic tone. Yes, um, I have a slight trigger to eye, eye rolling by my husband if he rolls his eyes when I think I'm saying something brilliant. Um, another one is I got abused by a nurse when I was a young girl and I woke up at home. The she just kept stabbing, stabbing, stabbing me and she was getting really angry that she couldn't find a vein in my skin. And so I have strategies now to look after myself and I don't get panicked when I think I have to go and uh, to the lab to give blood. I have found Eduardo and Eduardo goes slowly and he talks to me and he knows that I could faint if uh, he uses 
the wrong needle. So he always uses a butterfly needle. And I just feel so comforted by him. So I'll, I will wait an hour if he's not there doing a shift. So I'll say is Eduardo here. So there are ways that we can take care of ourselves. The more we take care of ourselves and the less we're triggered, the healthier we are. And if anybody wants to share their their uh, their triggers, uh, oh, Celeste did as well. Sound is my trigger, loud noise. That's very common, Celeste. Uh, need that for trying herb, yeah. Um, there are strategies and I um, have used them as well to calm down my aversion needles and also uh, loud loud voices because my dad used to be uh, quite quite loud. Um, yeah. So we're going to move on here to sources of emotional safety and comfort. So Eduardo has been a symbol of safety and comfort for me. And I just settle and I don't move out of my centered state with him. Right? So I used to have to return to center after I gave blood. Or if I had somebody yell at me and tell me to F off, uh, <laughs> which sometimes happens. People get triggered and then they, if they have an anger management issue, they may speak to you disrespectfully. And then I have a reaction to that. So obviously they're dysregulated. And then I get dysregulated, we're disconnected. And one of us needs to come back to center and welcome the other back to center. Well, thanks again, Celeste, for sharing. Um, not okay in the workplace, so it's not okay at home either. Or I don't have do that at home. I'd love to have a discussion with you, explore other options for you, Celeste, if ever. Well, I'll talk about that at the end of this uh, session. But thank you for your generous sharing. So sources of emotional safety and comfort. Again, I'm going to be stay quiet. And again, I'm going to look, you're going to look at this list and think about what people, what animals, what places, topics do you love? I love discussing professional, uh, professional and personal development. I, I actually enjoy talking about trauma because I'm very excited that we have the understanding and the research that helps us calm people that have traumatic uh, nervous systems that are living with trauma. We have better systems to help bring that event to calm, whether it's physical, sexual, verbal, emotional abuse, or any kind of abandonment or neglect. All right, let me stay quiet for a minute and allow you to take a look at this list and write down a couple of pieces for you, a couple ideas. Gardening is one for me. Thinking about my mother is another. I have three friends on my list that are key friends and then a smattering of other friends that I call when I am out of center and want to return to center. These are very important strategies for returning to center. And there's a typo error on the screen. It shouldn't say fierce eyes. It should say soft eyes. I hope everybody's going, oh, Patricia, it's okay to make mistakes because then that creates emotional safety for me. Those soft eyes. Being in nature is a very effective way to return to center. 
and many people find it effective. So I hope you've got your list. Again, thank you, Celeste. Uh, yes, i am uh, used EMDR for 20 years to help my clients bring to calm their distressing past events that created li them living with trauma. Uh, I now use a protocol typically um, called Finding Joy Trauma Treatment Technique and often inner child work. The two combined are quite powerful. So I'm glad you've got somebody that you're going to that can provide informed support to you. And EMDR does have a gold standard for dealing with trauma. So I'd like for you to put in an example of one of your favorite strategies to bring yourself to return to center, an emotional safety or comfort activity or person, just put each one of you please in the chat box so that we can inspire one another to consider uh, these options. I have a friend who knits, just she'll knit when she's talking, she'll knit when she's watching TV and she says it just brings her home to have her hands doing something. So every person has to find sort of their strategy for themselves. I'm looking at a chat box here. Just share with us your one of your favorites. Okay, here's I am. Yeah, yeah, emotional safe. Okay. Um, oh, oh, generous list here, Manisha. Your husband walking, drinking water, breathing, saying uh, saying the prayer. Yes, prayers are very, very good. There's an arrow up in business. Yes, yes, Celeste. Yeah, the uh, my my apology about fierce eyes under comfort. Focus, Lane saying, focus breathing, hugs from my husband. Oh, I know her husband, Chuck, and he gives amazing hugs. Yawning. Yes, yawning actually is a good physiological process to let go. You breathe in very deeply and you breathe out. Yes. Making ribbon skirts. Yes, anything that's traditional in your uh, tradi a traditional uh, ritual, rituals are very good at bringing people back to center. Most faiths in the world provide rituals and it brings up higher, higher consciousness. Okay, you do therapy as well. Okay, thank you. Once snapped at my mom when she asked if I wanted to bake muffins with her because I was so stressed out. Took a deep, yes, take a deep breath. Good for you, Andrea. All right. Going for walks, my husband, that's Anne's, and Donna's is time taking time to work out situations, see the part I played in the situation, and walking in nature. So the walking in nature, the taking time situation and, and doing what, what you're doing there, Donna, is you're bringing yourself and welcoming the other to back to center to sit down and say, let's get our prefrontal cortex back on. Let's connect and let's sort out what happened so that we can avoid that next time. And then walking in nature does also calm down the nervous system and tone or strengthen the vagal nerve. And Gwendolyn says, praying, beautiful. And Rannis is going for a walk and breathing. And I don't know how to pronounce your name. Oh, Maida, I hope I did it justice. Deep breathing, very good. And Manisha's provide us all with a creed prayer booklet. Thank you, that's generous of you. So I want to end on time. So I'm going to start moving through this fairly quickly. So thank you for sharing some of three, <laughs> Celeste, yeah, three dogs and a cat. That, yes, that's lots of oxytocin there. We need to have our touching needs met. So how can you increase and deepen your list of sources of calm and comfort? Deepen them and savor them. It's another word to think about. Well, now I'm going to introduce you to the three nervous system states that I describe in the book and I provide strategies to get out of two of them and to strengthen the third. 
which we've already actually talked about, but we'll do it a little bit more in depth. And I do have a workbook that I will offer you free if you want to fill in these exercises that I'm just going to briefly refer to. So Deb Dana, who has taken the polyvagal theory and made it accessible to therapists. She actually has a book called 50 Exercises for Therapists to Do with Clients. And I read that book and I thought, wow, that would take me a lifetime to do the 50 exercises with my clients. So you can see I have condensed the exercises down to what I found were the key ones to introduce my clients to. And Deb Dana, a social worker, has become quite the expert for resort and resource for therapists. So she says a flexible nervous system is a resilience system. And you can see these cars down here. One is racing, and there's a time to race to get away and to be safe. Sometimes when there's a deadline, you have to move fast. But if you are always racing and your heart is racing. That's not good for your health. It's not good for your vagus nerve. And you can see the car behind has burned itself out and it's stuck. And we need to repair it and get it back on the road. So there is a time to get really discouraged and stuck and evaluate what's going on. Maybe you need to let go of a relationship, right? So there's times where you want to feel that down, stuck state and take a look at it. But ideally, we want to return or be anchored in the center, <laughs> center of the lane of the road going at a nice pace, right? Sometimes you need to pass the car. You got to go fast. Other times you slow down. And other times you get stuck. So I use a car as an analogy in the book, Return to Center. So the charge, the charge state is that state of anxiety, of fight, of flight, of freeze. In the, in the stress management literature, it's called an activated sympathetic nervous state, but I just call it charge to make it simple for my clients. You can see the word sympathetic there. And these are some words that describe that state. When you're in there, you're flipped your lid, and this is going on. You need, we want to put a break on it. And in the book, Return to Center, are lists of strategies to put the break on, to slow down, to slow down the speeding. The speeding, we want to put the brake on and get back to the center of the lane. You're, you can hurt yourself or others when you are in this speeding, speeding, uh, out of almost out of well, often people are out of control. Then we have the give up state. This is where depression shows up, uh, loneliness, hopelessness. I don't know. Yeah, I have hopeless down there. You're hopeless. You're lost. You're depleted, depleted. And this is down medically in the dorsal vagal. I just. I wanted to make it simple for my clients. So I would say, oh, you're in the give up state. Sometimes we burn out in that charge state. We use up so much energy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And in the give up state, uh, we are depleted. And maybe we spent too much time feeling angry. And then we end up down in the depressed state where we actually say, what's what is wrong with me? In the charge state, we tend to blame other people and be yelling at them or running away from them and seeing them as the problem. We're in the give up state. We tend to see ourselves as losers. And it's like this. Oh, I'm stuck. I can hardly move. <laughs> Even talking, clients that are in this depressed give up state, they can hardly get um, a word out. And then we have the centered state, which we've talked a fair bit about, and that's in the nervous system language is the ventral vagal. Uh, ventral vagal is in good shape. Your vagus nerve is calmed, is 
is in, sort of like in charge. So then you're calm and you're capable. You can think rationally. You're grounded. You could connect with other people. Uh, this is the job of any therapist to stay in this state and welcome back the client when they get this dysregulated either into the charge state or the give up state. So in, in return to center, we have strategies to put the brake on the charge state to help come back to center. We have strategies for lifting up in the give up state and coming back to center. And then there's a whole section about how to strengthen the vagus nerve, how to strengthen your well being, and to know what it means and feels like to be in the centered state so that you're more quickly able to identify when you're not there. I'll give you a couple hints with the charge state, putting on that break. Breathing works really, really well, deep breathing. Uh, make the out breath longer than the in breath. And the opposite is true for the give up state. Uh, do not do deep breathing if you're depressed because you're already probably <gasps> sighing and doing deep breathing. You want to add energy. The names of those three people that bring you comfort, even listening to that caring voice at the end of the phone or on a Zoom session will help lift you out of that state. Going for a walk, nature is very helpful. Nature is helpful in both the charged and the give up state. And for the centered state, everything we know about being mentally and physically healthy, right? Sleeping, eating properly, exercise, and doing something about healing our trauma, plus having some stress management techniques. So the book, Return to Center, is available at solutionsforresilience.com uh, at the shop. You just, it'll, this link would take you directly there. It's also in the session guide. It's an easy read. It has these exercises and many more in it. And you can get the ebook for $9.95, or you can order from me the, this, oh, isn't it beautiful? I am so thrilled. Pomo Carpino, who lives here in Calgary, was the designer of the cover. And Sam Hester, as I mentioned, did the illustrations inside. This is my favorite illustration of hers. I have two people connecting, co-regulated in the garden. Yeah, and I would mail it to you. Uh, yeah, costs about $5 to mail this book, Return to Center in Canada. $11 to send it to the U.S. Postage has certainly gone up. So here's the bonus for you. And then um, we'll just open it for a few minutes of chat and then our time is up. So I offer a complimentary session to anybody who wants to just email me and say, Patricia, I'd like 45 minutes to an hour with you and we'll find a time. And uh, if you want to learn more about how you can use these strategies. I'd certainly be glad to do that with you. We could even map your nervous system, which has been very, very helpful to my clients. I've even had one of my clients take it on holiday with her so that she could stay in center with her child, her adult child with whom she was visiting. And they sometimes end up in arguments. And she said, Patricia, I usually used to last two days when I would visit and then I'd leave in a big huff, angry that I, things weren't going the way I wanted. And I, she stayed for three weeks. So she, you, she was monitoring herself, which was very effective for her. And I'm offering, if you want to email me and get the workbook that accompanies, I made this for therapists to do some of these exercises with their clients. And if you would like this workbook for you, for yourself and or somebody you care about, just email me and I will send it to you. It's got the exercises in it that coordinate with the book. 
So that's it. And I wish that you, when you get off center, know or have skills or people that will help you to return to center. Okay, so I invite us, Manisha will turn the recording off. And if you'd like to make a comment about what you think was helpful or ask a question, 